Jesus. Mark your Bible in Hebrews chapter 10 and Psalm 103. Hebrews 10 and Psalm 103. Um, let's get into this this morning. The essential series we're drawing to a close in this on practical theology, relational theology. This morning we're continuing on this theme that the King is coming and we're going to be in those two verses that I told you about, or two passages I should say. So why don't we stand up and uh, read together from Hebrews chapter 10. And I'm so excited about this this morning. Because we're going to look at the timeline of what's coming, the future news. We know the events, the details, there's some details we'll find out as they come to pass, but so exciting where we're headed. So verse 35, read out loud with me if you would, please. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Verse 37, once more. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Okay, before I pray, before you sit down, turn to somebody beside you, look them in the eyes and say, you have need of endurance. <laughs> you have need of endurance. <laughs> Amen. Now, everybody look up here and tell me. You're right. You're right. I, that's why I've got my running shoes on. I've been running here in, in throws so much. I need endurance. I need good feet. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we do have need of endurance. And to hold on to our confidence, our faith in you, Lord. And we need all the strength that you would give us in days like these, Lord, as we're living in these last days. And we're so thankful, Father, that we live according to this promise that yet a little while and he who is coming will come. And we just want to be ready, Father. So open our, our hearts and our minds and our eyes today, Lord, to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a seat, please. <clears throat> well, last week we started a, a three-part Q&A on eschatology. Eschatology, if you're here for the first time, it just means study of the last things. It's a study of the last days, the last things, and specifically the coming of Christ. But we started a three-part three uh, Q&A, and these are just the three questions that we're trying to answer last week, this week, and next week. Does the Bible speak of the last days and the coming of Christ? Well, of course it does. We didn't make this up. And secondly, today, is there a clear end-time timeline or order of events? And then next week, we're going to look at how we should be living. If that's true, and it is, that Christ is coming... What does that mean about our life and our lifestyle and our expectation? How should we be living here in the light of the second coming of Jesus Christ? Now, today on, on, our, on our study, we're just going to be looking at the order of events, the timeline, and, and I have to qualify this, as I understand it in Scripture, the order of events that are coming our way that is basically future news, because prophecy is just future news. God telling us what will happen in the, either the near or the not too near future. But I have to give you, uh, it's not a disclaimer, but it's an FYI. It's just a little bit of a heads up, maybe a warning. We're going to try to put these future events that are clearly mentioned in the Bible on, on a timeline or an order of events, the rapture. Anybody ever heard of the rapture? Anybody ever heard of the millennium? Anybody heard about the second coming of Jesus Christ, second death? Second resurrection, all of these. Anybody ever heard of the Great Tribulation? You, you thought that that was when your children became teenagers, didn't you? In one sense, it is. And I used to think, I know we're out of here before my kids become teenagers because I'm not going through the Great Tribulation, but I was wrong. I went through that tribulation. But, um, so we're going to talk about these judgments and all. But here's the disclaimer, or here's the warning. We might disagree on a couple of things. How many of you have ever heard somebody talk about the last days or end times, and you heard them say something, and you thought, I, I'm not sure I agree with you. Let me see the hands of those. Yeah, yeah, so have I. And I, you know who I've disagreed with at times? Myself. I have. I've said things that now, you know, a little later down the road, I think I see it just a, a little bit different. So 
we're going to talk about some of these issues that we might disagree on, the timing of the rapture. There are good, godly, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving people who have a difference of opinion on whether the rapture takes place before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation, and, and, and they, they'll point to scriptures that they feel gives them um, you know, a, a, the credence to, to put their hope right down there upon their specific stance. And, and there's those that have a difference of opinion on the millennium. Is it really literally a thousand year reign of Christ? And there's good people that have differences of opinion there. And when do we get our new body? And what's it going to look like? And so on, on all of these things, we might have some differences of opinion. But let me take you to what we all agree on. At least I hope we all agree on this. And that's that Jesus Christ is coming again. Because why? Well, he said he was coming again. And that's really enough for me. If all I had was John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, that's enough. I expect to see Jesus again here. He said he would come again. I go to prepare a place. If I go, I'll come and get you. Peter believed it too. He spoke about it more like an inference. He said, there are people, scoffers, mockers, who will say in the last days, he's not coming. And Peter is saying, oh, yes, he is coming. He's coming because he said he was coming. John, not when he wrote the gospel of John, but in his little letter of 1 John, he says this, and it's such a beautiful you know, scene I, I see in my mind where he says, we don't know what we will be yet. But we know that when he appears, in other words, when he comes, we're going to be like him because we will see him as he is. Bless you. Double bless you there. <laughs> and in, in Titus, when Paul, and Paul spoke more about the, the surety, the absolute assurance of the coming of Christ than any of the other letter writers in scripture. And here's what he said to Titus when he spoke about that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Glory, keep that, that word in mind. Say it with me. Glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at it, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. I am more convinced than ever that Paul wrote Hebrews, but if I'm wrong, it doesn't matter. Whoever wrote Hebrews, here's what they said. To those who wait for him, that's for Jesus, he will appear a second time apart from sin. That's the glorious appearing. He won't come in incognito, just looking like a normal human being that many people miss because he looked too human. He'll appear in glory and we'll see him really as he is. He'll appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Now one more, James, Jesus' little brother. We're going to get to chapter five and oh, I don't know, maybe, you know, three or four years when our study through James, but no, he says, be patient. He's coming. His coming is near. That's from Jesus' little brother. Imagine the moment when, when James realized, whoa, my big brother is God in the flesh. <laughs> my big brother is my savior. What he did on that cross, my big brother washed my sins away. And he's saying to the, to the whole world, hey, be patient. My big brother's coming back. My Lord and savior. He's coming back. His time, the time of his coming is near. So we agree on this, that Jesus will return. I just need to hear just at least a, a, a middle volume amen to that. Jesus is coming back. He will, he will return for his people. But let's take a look at the last time timeline or the last day's order of events. In just a little while, the coming one will come and he will not delay. So what happens next on the prophetic calendar? Actually, there's two things that happen next. One of them happens, and at the same moment that one of them happens, the other one begins to happen. Let's take a look at this. The very first one that I believe is next is the rapture of the church. And that means that's the catching up, the calling away, the taking home of all those people who are alive at that time and all those who have also lived before and already passed away, where there's this great gathering in the sky of all those who have trusted Jesus Christ. The catching away. No, the word rapture is not found in the New Testament anywhere, but the truth is found there. When, when Paul in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, let me tell you what's going to happen. On that day, the angel and the trumpet and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we will climb a ladder, and we will be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord in the air. The Latin word that was used to translate caught up is rapturus. And so we've held on to that, that term to say the same thing. The rapture of the church is when we're caught up together with them to meet the Lord Jesus 
in the air. That's what's called in, in, first, or in, in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6, it's called the first resurrection. Now listen to what it says. It says, blessed are those who take part in the first resurrection because they escape that next death. They will not have to suffer the second death. We'll get to that in just a second. But it's that first resurrection when we're caught up to be with Him. And let me tell you, nothing else has to happen on God's prophetic calendar for the rapture of the church to take place. It could be, it really literally could be today. Everything that had to happen prophetically until the, 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 you know, the end times began to really unfold with the tribulation period, all that's happened. Israel is a nation again. For the fourth time, they're present in the land of, of Israel in the Middle East. That's amazing. We talked about that last week. I won't dig into that again. But that, that has happened. There's nothing else that needs to happen. Now, I'm really okay. I'm really okay with Jesus if he decides today is the day. It'd be kind of cool if he let me finish the message today, but I won't be upset if he doesn't. And you won't be upset either because it won't ha- hold a candle to what we're about to see. But at the very same moment that Jesus calls his church off the planet, that's when he comes for his church. It doesn't say he comes to earth and puts us on a bus and he takes us to heaven. He calls us off the planet. It's happened before. Jesus rose off the planet. Others in the Old Testament, they rose from the planet and they were caught up into heaven. Elijah was one of those who was caught up into heaven. It appears that Enoch got one, a, a chariot ride kind of into heaven. However they were gone, it's, and it's, it's nothing new. But the next thing that takes place at the very same moment that the church is cut away is the great tribulation. This is no fun. Absolutely no fun. Simultaneously with the rapture of the church, it's mentioned in, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 24, in Mark 13, in Luke chapter 21. It's spoken about in Daniel and other prophets in the Old Testament. I think it talks about it in Ezekiel, of course, as well. This time of trouble on the planet and especially against Israel like the world has never seen. Terrible, terrible time on the planet. Now, I've told you that I believe that we're out of here before, and obviously in the order of events, that the church is gone before the tribulation period begins on the planet. Does that comfort anybody just a little bit, any Christians just a little bit? You know why it does? Because we read about the trouble and we think, oh man, I really don't want to be around for that. I'd like to escape that tribulation. And people will say because of that mentality, you're just escapists. You want to get out of here before it gets tough. Did you know that Jesus said you won't get out of here before it gets tough? You will not get out of here before tribulation happens to you. Jesus promised us in John 16. He said, trust me, in this world you will have tribulation. He didn't say in this world you will go through the great tribulation, but you'll have trouble. And many of you have already begun to suffer the trouble. It might be in in America, sometimes it's mockery. Sometimes it might get physical. Sometimes people might want to literally do you harm because you love Jesus or you told somebody they love about Jesus and they don't want them following Jesus. Sometimes it might be exclusion. Sometimes you might be cut off the invitation list because, oh, they're just a Jesus freak now. But trust me, some of your brothers and sisters down through 2,000 years have suffered what they would have to call great, great tribulation. And they've suffered unbelievable pain not just in an execution, but in the torture that led to the execution because they wouldn't turn their backs on Jesus Christ. Do you think they didn't feel great tribulation? You read down through church history and how many times when when something like Second World War takes place or persecution, people who live in those areas, they turn to places like, like this in Scripture and they say, maybe this is the great tribulation. I don't think that the pain that people will experience during the Great Tribulation will be any less than the pain that people have experienced through their own personal tribulation. It's not an escapist mentality. It really isn't. And and by the way, do you know, I, I know Christians, you probably do too, who believe that they're going to live through the Great Tribulation, or at least midway through the Great Tribulation. And partly, you're not going to believe this, but some of them are excited about it for only one reason because they'll get to tell people about Jesus during that time of great trouble. 
They believe the trouble's coming, and they believe that maybe they're going to be there. I disagree with them on that point, but they're still my brothers and still my sisters. We know that we will have tribulation while we're here. Here's the difference, and I'll, I'll say this very briefly. The difference between just tribulation that Jesus promised all believers and the great tribulation that's coming upon the earth, there's two differences. One is the source of the tribulation, who it's coming from, and the other is the effect of that tribulation. The trouble that comes upon us in this world, the, the trouble here now comes from the troubler of our souls, the one that wants to defeat everything that we stand for. The source of it is the devil. The source of it is that kingdom of darkness. All I know some of the trouble we go through is just the trouble of doing life on a broken planet. But the trouble that the enemy sends against us. You know what the, well, the source of it is the enemy, but do you know what the, the purpose of it is? To try to defeat you. To try to scare you out of serving Jesus in a hard time. To try to silence you. And make you go invisible in, in your witness, which is no witness at all if it's invisible. Just to sort of hide away from the trouble and, and, and live it out until it, until it all blows over. Now, you're still saved if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. But the, the effect of it so often is to silence Christians. But you know what the wonderful effect sometimes of that trouble is? You know how God takes what the enemy uses for evil and he turns it into good? What the enemy sends to destroy us, God uses to strengthen us and to build character, deeper character in, it, in us. And the devil hates that. So sometimes he just cranks it up a little bit. But the, the, the source of tribulation today is from the enemy and the effect of it sometimes is to silence us and sometimes to just make us go all quiet and just forget it, about serving Jesus out loud and openly. But the great tribulation is a very different source. The trouble that's coming upon this planet during the seven years of great tribulation, the source of that is God. And, and the point of it is that it's His wrath that is poured out upon a rejecting world. It's His wrath upon, and here's how it's described in Scripture, upon the sons, and you could say sons and daughters, or the children of disobedience, who having known have rejected the simple gospel and I've said, I don't, I, don't, I don't want God in my life. Nobody tells me what to do. I heard this the other day. I was walking to my car across the street at, at Bellaterra. And, and as I'm getting into my truck there, I see these two guys going by. look like they just come from the gym, and they're talking out loud. They seemed to get louder when they got near me. I don't, I don't know why that was, but they seemed to get louder um, on purpose as they got close to me. And this one guy says to his buddy, he said, you know, nobody tells us what to do. Nobody has a right to tell us what to do except us. We make the decisions on what we do with our life. And his buddy said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and that's exactly the mentality of the people that will be left on this planet during the Great Tribulation. Those who said, God doesn't tell me what to do. No one tells me what to do. I'm the Lord of my own life. I'm the leader. I'm the captain of my ship. And some will even sink as the captain of their ship. And foolish decisions made just like that. But the source of the tribulation that's going to hit this earth in the great tribulation, the source of it is God, and the, and the effect of it is to bring judgment upon this world. And this is incredible to me. Here's going to be one of the other effects of the, the tribulation that hits this planet. Some people will wake up. How many of you woke up to the love of God and the truth of the gospel during a time of pain in your life. Let me just see. Did that happen to anybody? I've heard that so many times. Someone who, 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 who got hit almost died. A, a man I've told you about before, an Irishman that I met over in Belfast. He said at the end of a day, a hard day, an incredibly horrific day of battle, he had a scar upon his jaw, the lower part of his jaw. And he said if that had been, and that was from battle, if that had been an inch lower, he said, I would have been lost forever. And he said, I got down on my knees and I thanked Jesus for dying for me on the cross that day. And he woke up in the pain that came upon him. And the, the Bible says that that offer will still be on the table. Read, read Revelation carefully. You'll see three or four times where after one bowl of wrath is poured out or this seal is broken and this terrible thing happens, it said, and yet people still would not surrender, still would not believe. We know that some will. 
because there's a whole bunch of what we call tribulation saints who came to faith during the tribulation and they weren't raptured like popcorn when they came to Christ. Can you imagine how many people will, will come knocking on your door and when you don't answer, they go in anyway because they've heard Christians are disappearing and you're gone and they realize, oh my goodness, they weren't lying to me. And they say, Jesus, forgive my sins. And they wait for a personal rapture. It doesn't happen that way. Many of them will die for their faith, but will be martyred during the great tribulation. And on the other side, they will have considered that almost nothing compared to the glory that they will inherit as they step into the presence of God. But sometimes there will be, sometimes even the pain that hits us in life is what brings us to Christ. And some of that will happen during the great tribulation time. There will be many that will be saved, but it looks like many more that will say, still, no, God, don't interfere with my life. So why do I believe that we will not be here? Well, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you don't need to turn there, I'm just going to reference it. Verse 9, Paul, as he's just unfolded all of this truth about these days that are coming, the rapture of the church and us going, and then the man of perdition that comes, he says, but let me tell you, we, believers, we are not appointed unto wrath. We're not appointed unto wrath, but to experience salvation. I believe Paul is saying right there that trouble that is coming, which he knew to be the wrath of God, we will not be here for that. We will have been lifted up and placed in heaven at that point. So that's the way that I see that. And you might see things just a little bit differently than I do. And, and on all of this, look, you don't have to agree with me on this. You can be wrong if you want to be wrong. You can, <laughs> I'm being facetious. I have great, great friends that disagree on, on, on some of these points. But also, in that same time in heaven, when the church has been taken home and while the seven years of great tribulation are taking place, these two things will also be happening in heaven. You and I will appear before the judgment seat of Christ and we will be there at the wedding supper of the Lamb. And you're thinking, wait, wait a minute, you just said I'm not going to be judged. You just said God's wrath is not going to be poured out upon me. This is not God's wrath. The Bible talks about the, the judgment seat of Christ that every believer will appear before. And you know what that will be? That will be, it's almost like, it, it, it looks like a ceremony. And, and, and it looks like, here's what's going to happen. That you are going to get a reward for something that you did. Maybe for lots of things that you did in serving people and loving people here because you love God, because you love Christ. So here's what I think is going to happen. You're going to, now, however God approaches us, he's going to say, hey, you know what? I, I caught you, Aaron. I caught you loving your family. And he's going to bless you with some kind of a, a crown or a blessing. He's going to say, Joy, oh, I know this guy you had to live with all these years. And you deserve such a crown. It's going to be so heavy. I don't know how you're going to be holding it on your head. But he's, she, he's going to say, I caught you loving your husband. I caught your love in your family. E even down to this, where it's, I caught you giving a cup of water to somebody thirsty. And the scripture says, even that will not escape God's notice and then his reward. I, I don't know, I just see this as one of the most awkward times that there could be an awkward time in heaven. I just cannot imagine this not feeling awkward. When, when you know, somehow I'm approached with a reward for doing something simple, just for the glory of God, not for the praise of men, and God gives me a crown? I think that might be why we read in Revelation that they all cast their crowns down before him. I, I just see like a, a Mount Everest of crowns before Jesus as we all say, you deserve all of this. You deserve everything. But he's going to bless you for the way that you loved him by loving other people. He's, he's, he's catching you right now the way that you love your family, the way that you love your, your, even, even your enemies. He said, man, I caught you loving your enemy. Praying for the man that was about to put the ax to your neck. Asking God to forgive him. There's going to be a reward as we stand before the judgment seat. It's the assessment. It's not God slapping us around in heaven. It's judging our works. And the ones that were done with great love, there's going to be great reward. And then there's that beautiful scene of the 
of the, the wedding supper of the Lamb. Read about it in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. It says the, lamb is, the, the bride has made herself ready. And here's this beautiful scene of us sitting down at a table with our beloved as we assemble as his beloved. Oh, what, what do you think the menu is going to be like? at the wedding supper of the Lamb. How many of you think it's going to be vegetarian? Anybody think it's going to be vegetarian? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm okay with that. Whatever. whatever. You think it's going to be maybe this endless buffet and you can just keep eating and you'll have a, a stomach that won't hurt after your fifth time back? How many of you go to the, the buffet restaurants and they're like, what, to almost 10 bucks now? And you think, I'm going back enough times I get this down to 50 cents a plate. I'm just going to, I'm going to get my money out of it and you end up in pain over it. But you know what? It's almost like it's, the, it's the, the wedding reception after the beloved has been called home. And there we are in the presence of the one that loves us. And we become like him because we see him just as he is. And, and we sit down to celebrate the beginning of this new phase of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm taking too long on that. Let me move on to the next one. The next thing, obviously, is the second coming of Jesus. I thought he came. Didn't, he, didn't, didn't you just tell me he already came? Yes, he came for us and he took us off the planet. But now at this point, he comes with us. And he comes back down to the planet. And again, there's an event. And then something else that starts at the exact same time that he arrives. The rapture kicked off the seven years of tribulation. The second coming, it kicks off another period of time, way longer than seven years. And that's the millennium the millennium kingdom. Read about it in, in uh, Revelation chapter 20. Now the wonderful thing, another incredible thing that happens right at the beginning when Jesus shows up, one of the very first things that we read about is that somebody gets locked up for a thousand years. The devil gets locked up for a thousand years, which might be a clue as to why there is a thousand years of peace on the planet for a thousand years. Because the troubler, troubler of your souls will not trouble you again for that thousand year period where he's been locked up. But let me tell you what that millennium I think is all about. I believe it's literal. I believe it is a timed 1,000 year period. I believe that the, the great tribulation is a timed seven year period that starts when the rapture of the church takes place. Seven years later, I think you could probably set your, your calendar if you have one at that time in heaven. That's when the millennium begins, a thousand-year reign of Christ after he returns. And what the millennium is all about is this. It's life as it, would, as it could have been lived on this planet, year after year after year after year for a millennium, a thousand years. Yes, because the devil is locked up. And I think even beyond that, because there's just this this beautiful, loving submission to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And the Bible tells us this too, that the first time he came was to suffer and to save. Second time is to rule and to, and to reign. And he says in Scripture, we're going to reign with him. Again, this feels a little bit awkward to me. I look at, you know, Jesus comes back and he's the king. He's like the president of the whole world and he's in charge of everything. And I don't know, we're like his senators and his congressmen, but that, that's not really, that's not sounding good these days, you know, senators and congressmen. But we get to somehow, we're a part of his administration and we serve his purposes. And by the way, it'll be on this planet, not another planet and not a renewed earth yet. There still will be the Grand Canyon. How many haven't seen the Grand Canyon in person? You'll have time. You'll have a thousand years to go check it out. How many have not been to Maui or Kauai? I've never been there. I can't wait to see it. It'll be this beautiful planet that he made. Here for a thousand years, life as it could have been, and then Satan again is loosed at the end of that. But quickly, after he pulls together another little war, especially against Israel, all of that, the, the, war, the, the warriors are defeated and Satan is cast into the lake of fire and you've seen the last of him. Everybody say hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. He's gone forever and ever. He didn't like that when you said that, but that's okay. Get ready for the battle. He's going to continue to battle us until that day. Powerful news. These will be amazing headlines in those days. The next thing though is the second resurrection. And again, this is not a pleasant thing. This is the second death. After we've looked in, in Revelation 20 at the wedding supper of the Lamb, and the second resurrection is immediately spoken about in verses 11 and 13 before the great white what? Throne. 
the great white throne. You know who's not going to be judged at the great white throne? Not a single believer is going to be in that bunch. This is all those who had purposefully rejected the gospel and said no to the offer of God's forgiveness and his love. It's a, it's a resurrection that results in final and fair judgment. And there's, n- there's no sign of anybody saying, God, how dare you? How dare you call me guilty? You know the songs we hear in Scripture? Those brief little choruses that we'll be singing, holy, holy, holy. What's the other one? Worthy, worthy, worthy. There's no record of anybody raising their fists saying, unfair, unfair, unfair. Or how dare you, how dare you, how dare you call me guilty. This might be one of the scenes where you see every knee bending in, in, in humility before God. Literally, this will happen. The proof of their rebellion and, and their rejection will be complete. That they had said no to the offer of salvation. It's not a pleasant thing. It's the second death, the second resurrection that, that, that John had said, oh, how blessed are those who experience the first resurrection because the second death won't touch them. The second death is what happens after this great white throne judgment where those gathered before Christ, they receive the sentence that they knew was coming. And they're apart from God then forever. And then we got to have something good up here next, don't we? You know it's good. You know what's next, don't you? The next thing is the new heaven and the new earth. Maybe there'll be a new Grand Canyon. Maybe a new Grander Canyon. Maybe it doesn't look like there's seas from what we understand, but whatever it is, it is going to be outrageously wonderful and beautiful and we get to explore it forever. A new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, and a new you. You know, somewhere in here we get these new bodies that are incorruptible and cannot fade away and they never wither and I can't wait to get that. And you're going to get it too. There's all of this newness when he makes all things new, a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. I've got to insert this here. I know you've heard this before, maybe from me or from somebody else. This, this new Jerusalem is really interesting to me. There's a couple of things you need to recognize when you're reading it. It never says it comes to earth. It says the new Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven. And then we're just told some measurements. It's pretty big. It, it says that it's this dimension, you know, uh, let's say from right to left, and it's the same dimension across the other way, and it's the same dimension from top to bottom. So you could say, well, that measures like a cube, but it also measures like a sphere. That's just a big round ball from top to bottom, from right to left, let's say east to west, and you know, whatever, the four points of the compass. So it could be measuring out a ball. And I love this suggestion. Nobody could prove this. We'll have to wait and see. But I love the suggestion that the New Jerusalem is like this, this orbital city that comes down out of God and it orbits the earth like a moon. See all the planets where God put moons out there? Some of them have multiple moons. I just, I like that idea. We get to go in and out, which means what? If we're on the New Earth and we go out to the New Jerusalem, we get to fly. I'm just hoping we get to fly, you know? I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. You can disagree with me on that, and you could be right for, for all that, that I know on that. But the new heaven and the new earth. And by the way, the thing I was joking about last week or wondering out loud about, do you ever do that? You wonder out loud, and then two days later you realize, that was stupid. But I was wondering out loud about the idea of when we get to heaven, do you think God will say, look, you can eat of every tree of the garden except one? I don't think that's going to happen. And I'd say, I hope that doesn't happen. You know why it won't happen? Well, I found the verse. It's in in Revelation 21, verse 27. It says, nothing offensive is going to be there. Nothing that causes pain. Nothing that causes any misery. So whatever you see hanging on a tree, whatever you pull up out of the ground, you're you're allowed to eat it. It'll be on the menu for us. It will all be safe. Now, that's the end of my timeline. But I I know what's missing for you. You want to know what 666 is all about. Well, we're going to save that for a study through Revelation sometime beginning in 2018 when we get to the first of the year. But I I want to kind of suggest it's probably not a product barcode that that you have on everything that you buy. That doesn't mean that you've taken the mark 
of the beast. It's probably not a tattoo. I, I, I don't know. It's going to be something that you will know that to take this mark, I am standing in rebellion against God. I'm choosing to worship a system or an antichrist, which is the other thing that you wish I'd talked about, right? Who is the antichrist? Can I tell you who was supposed to be the antichrist? Well, over the 47 years that I've been a Christian, <laughs> first one I remember, it was supposed to be Henry Kissinger. Before that, some people thought it was Stalin. A lot of people in Europe thought it was Hitler. I wasn't around then, but in, in my life, it's supposed to have been Ronald Wilson Reagan because each one of his names had six letters. Oh, it has to be Reagan. <laughs> and then it was supposed to be Barack Obama. Some think it's Prince Charles. Uh, some think it's Lord Maitreya. Anybody remember Lord Maitreya? If you're my age or older, you probably remember. He, he was some Eastern holy man, and it was supposed to be him. It's probably not your seventh grade biology teacher, though, I would imagine. It'll be clear. I believe that the, the Antichrist could be alive on the planet today. I think, I think it's very, very possible. And again, we'll talk about those things when we get in, into Revelation. But of course, there's more details. But this, I think, is enough to move us into action and to move us into witness, to make us care enough about the people that we love and the people that are around us to let them know that God loves them and he has a great plan for them and there are some massive changes coming for this planet. Th these are the core truths upon which followers of Jesus believe, especially this one. Jesus is coming again. He will return according to his promise. A quick reminder, the point of prophecy was to remind us the king is coming. On our study of eschatology, it's, it's all to move us to evangelism to tell other people. What's the point of this though? What we do here. Let me tell you what the point of the pulpit is. To, to begin with, hopefully there's some people here who haven't come to Christ yet. So it, it's that one time where I get to talk to some people and the very small percentage of those that are probably gathered here, a small percentage who haven't surrendered their life to Jesus Christ yet. How many of you, by the way, you came to Christ because you attended a Christian meeting, a Christian gathering, you went to church, and you heard the gospel, and you said, that's what I've been waiting to hear, and you surrendered to Jesus. Now, if that's you, and you haven't surrendered to Christ yet, I believe God has you here because he wants you. He wants you in heaven. He wants you with him. And you need to know that you cannot save yourself. And so your Father in heaven sent his Son, who suffered and died, the penalty and the sentence that you deserve and that I deserve. We're going to read about that in Psalm 103. Get ready and turn there, okay? But it's to preach the gospel. The second thing is to teach the whole counsel of God. To just teach everything that's in the Bible. Whether you go through it systematically from Genesis straight through to Revelation or you make your way to all those truths. Don't, we can't just sort of ride our hobby horses, our favorite doctrines. We have to preach the whole counsel of God like Paul said to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 that he had done. But here's where it gets very exciting for me. Why do we do this? Why do we set up like this? Whether it's here in church or we gather in a living room with a bunch of people around and we do house church, why do we do this? It's to equip you and me for the work of the ministry. To equip you from the study of the word and the preaching of the gospel to show you how simple it is to tell somebody just this, your sins can be forgiven. You can pray the prayer of Pastor Bill's Irish friend and just say, thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins on the cross. And ask somebody, have you ever thanked Jesus for dying for you? And just see where that conversation goes to equip you for the work of the ministry. That's what this is all about. But when we hit prophecy, I mentioned this at the beginning, we get so, oh, all right, this is the good stuff. But the good stuff of prophecy has been revealed to us to prepare us to be his witnesses. Look, look at what Jesus said in John chapter 13 and 14, that probably within minutes of each other, he's predicting his death, he's predicting other elements, future events, and he says, I tell you these things now so that when they come to pass, you will believe. I want, I want, to, I want to show you what he didn't say that we so often do. I tell you these things in advance so that for 2,000 years, you can fight over them and divide over them and disagree over them and defame somebody that doesn't see it quite the same way that you do. Jesus didn't say, I tell you these things so you can fight over them, but so that when they come to pass, there are some of these fine points and even big points 
of, of end times truth that we will not know for sure what? Until it happens. And then we'll know. We'll know the timing of the rapture when it happens and not until it happens. So let's stop setting those dates and let's just be people that are ready to tell others just so that we can tell others about Jesus. Now next weekend, we're going to answer the third question, how should we be living in these days? And Jesus had something to say about that. And so what I want you to do is try to second guess me. I want you to go into the Gospels and read the red letters of Jesus. See if you can find anything Jesus said about how we're supposed to live in last days. And most of what I'll share next week will come from the red letters of Jesus as he talked to his disciples about what to do and how to live in the last days. But, but remember this about last days, and then we're going to close with Psalm 103. There's two different last days. There's the cosmic last days. That's what we've been talking about here. When this, when this planet is set aside and a new planet is formed, a new heaven and a new earth. It's the end for this system, this universe as we know it. But the more profound last days are your last days and my last days. My friend Duffy might be in his very, very last days, but he's ready. He's ready for the, the new day that, that's coming his way. Yes, we will all one day die. That will look like your end, but it's not your end. It's not the end of you. It's just the end of phase one of you. It's just a passage. It's just a transition point. What we like to call that main event is really just an introduction in comparison to what eternity is going to be. Now, now, now what's coming for us after this introduction to life is the encore. And encore, I want encore to take a much bigger meaning than it typically takes for you, okay? Let's say you've been at your, 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 your favorite musician's concert. You've been, okay, you've been to see Neil Diamond, okay? And <laughs> why do people laugh at that? But you've been to see Neil Diamond, and you love it so much. And, and I went to a Neil Diamond concert, and it was really, really, it was still good. He still sounded good. I went to a Bob Dylan concert, and that was a whole different story. But, <laughs> but at the end of it, we did what everybody does. And it, we, we cried out for encore, encore. And then they come back and they sing another little song and then they say goodbye to you forever. But our encore is the greatest part of our life and our existence. This life will just have been an introduction and then the encore, which is actually the main event, is for eternity, for all eternity. Look up here on the screen. This is going to lay right over what we're going to read in uh, Psalm 103. Isaiah said it, Peter said it, all flesh is like grass, all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. If any of you noticed your, your flower kind of withering and you're fading, your glory fading a little bit, I came home last night and it was just time to get a haircut and I was like, Joy, can you cut my hair tonight? And so we, we bought one of these little, you know, shavers. And, and so I, I put out the, the numbers. Let's do a number two on the side, and let's do a number three on the top. And, and she said, are you sure it's a number three on the top? I said, yeah, number three is fine. And so she, she did what I asked her to do, and I said, maybe we'll do a number four next time, you know. And, <laughs> but when I, when I bent down my head to look, I realized, oh, my gosh, it's getting thin up there. My flower's fading, <laughs> fading away. I'm withering, just like you're withering. How many of you have felt the wither recently? And the wither's not the weather, it's just you. Parts are wearing out. Psalm 103. I'm going to read this out loud, and I'm going to call you in to read with me in just a little bit. I'm going to ask the, the worship team if they would come back out and, and play as I read this to you. You know, one of my favorite scriptures about what's coming our way is it, I think it's in Zechariah or Zephaniah, but it talks about God singing over us, singing his songs over us. I love that image. I don't know what that will be like, but, and I'm not pretending to play God here, but I'm just going to walk through the sanctuary as I read Psalm 103 around, 103 around you. So listen to these words. This is Psalm of David. David wrote this before, um, before Isaiah wrote his version of it and before... Obviously, Peter wrote his. But by the way, at the men's retreat, we sang, Bless the Lord, O my soul, 
and we sang the first verse that, that, that uh, you know, um, the sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. I love that verse. Second verse is, you're rich in love and you're slow to anger. And I got my phone out because I wanted to, to video all these guys singing that last verse. Ooh, you know the last verse? But on that day, when my strength is withering <laughs> and fading, when my strength is fading, the end comes near and my time has come. And they didn't sing it. So we're going to sing that, but first we're going to read this. Okay, guys, go ahead and start. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, and he heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He's the God you always hoped he would be, that merciful. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. That means he's been better to us than he should have been. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far is he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Dads, dads, be merciful to your kids. For he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. Read with me in verse 15 down to 18. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him, and His righteousness to children's children, to such as keep His covenant, and to those who remember His commandments to do them. Let's stand together and keep reading. The Lord has established His throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of the word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, and you ministers of his, who do his pleasure. Let's make it louder. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion, Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Let's sing together. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before.
soon he who is coming will come and he will not delay and it's not a fairy tale and if you're playing around with the idea that it is you're living so dangerously and so unnecessarily in darkness Jesus is ready today to save you if you'll just say to him thank you for dying for me on the cross and turn from the darkness that you've let fill your life and ask him for forgiveness ask him to set you free we'll do it and you that are thinking right now, no, you don't understand. I've done too many wicked, horrible, terrible things. I should be locked up forever for what I've done. He knows it. And that's why he died for you. That's why Christ came. One day, he who is coming will come. Now let me read the card to you that you were given. This is one of my favorite things about heaven. Listen to this. This one, this one, I should have put it on our timeline. God himself shall be with them and wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more and never again shall there be sorrow or crying or pain for all the former things are past and gone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Will the Lord bless you and keep you and stir you Make you confident and keep you looking for the coming of the King. May you, may you live on tiptoes just like Zach, looking for the coming of the King because he's coming soon. He will come. If you need communion today, it's going to be served over the prayer room. There's going to be a prayer team here. And if you're ready today to say, Jesus, I'm tired of living for me. I want to live for you. Then you come running forward or turn to the Christian you came with and say, let's pray. I want to give the rest of my life to Jesus and ask him to forgive you. He'll take you. God bless you. Grace and peace to you. In Jesus' name. God bless you. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach with Pastor Bill Welsh. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.